Good morning and welcome to this toolbox presentation of the Practices Project Final Conference. My name is Martina Barro and I will give you some important information before starting with the presentation from our experts. The activities of the Practices Final Conference are divided between expert panels and toolbox presentations. Three expert panels are planned from March 27th until April 15th. You will find the descriptions of the different topics on the current slide. Sessions, light gray, have already been done but are still accessible from IFU's webpage. Four toolbox presentations complete the activities for the conference. These pre recorded sessions will focus on a specific tool developed during the project and will allow the participants to understand the fundamentals of its use. Please note that the toolbox presentations will be made available on the IFU's webpage in French and English, captioned in the other language. You will find more information on all the different activities on the IFU's webpage of the final conference following the link on the slide. Now, some information concerning several details on the development of the following session. Toolbox presentations will have an estimated duration of 45 minutes. You can download the presentation along with some other documents the experts would like to share with you on the handout section on the panel on your left. As this is a pre-recorded presentation, we won't have a typical Q&A after the session. Instead, you can send us your questions using the chat by clicking on the icon shown in the slide. The experts will answer your question in the next few days. Later, you will find the answers in the dedicated session on the EFS webpage. Please don't forget to send your questions during the presentation. Do not wait until the end as you risk not having enough time. Finally, please answer our satisfaction survey at the end of the presentation. Today's presentation will be the Citizen Agora, developed by the University of Applied Sciences of Salzburg and presented by Markus Pausch and Heiko Werner. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the webinar. Hello and uh, welcome uh, to our presentation on Citizens Agora. Uh, my colleague Heiko Berner and me welcome you here um, for this presentation in the framework of the practices uh, project. We are going to present you during the next about 45 minutes findings and recommendations from our work package uh, and our task Citizens Agora. Um, we have prepared a PowerPoint presentation, as you can see, and um, you will have uh, the possibility to go into detail afterwards. So we will not mention every single aspect uh, that is on the slides, uh, but you can uh, then go through the slides and uh, ask questions uh, per email or um, via EFOS. Here on the first um, slide, you can see an overview about what we are going to present you. We start with an introduction to um, tell you something about the general idea of uh, Citizens Agora. Uh, then we will continue with the four goals uh, that are uh, related to this Citizens Agora and with concrete examples. And uh, then uh, we will uh, finish with uh, some lessons learned uh, and uh, some recommendations um, that we drew out of uh, these um, activities. Some general remarks about uh, Citizens Agora at the beginning. Well, um, Citizens Agora um, is aimed at offering spaces for inclusive citizenship, uh, for participation, and for empowerment on the local level. The idea behind is that um, in uh, processes of radicalization and uh, extremism, we um, assume that, um, that uh, we need to um, prevent already at a very early stage um, certain um, aspects um, of radicalization and um, try to uh, open spaces in the public uh, so that uh, people can come in, can get into a dialogue and exchange um, and the activities um, in the framework of Citizens Agora, they can provide information and training for different target groups. They uh, bring together different groups for better mutual understanding. They offer space for dialogue and for discussion and uh, they can give a voice to those 
who often have no or little access to public debates. So in all its forms, uh, citizens agoras uh, allow or should allow for democratic experience, for empowerment, for self-efficacy, and uh, thereby um, prevent uh, at a very early stage that people are excluded, marginalized, or uh, have a, uh, a tendency to, to radicalization. Uh, on uh, this slide, uh, you can see a table where we uh, show the different examples uh, that were carried out in the cities of the uh, project uh, consortium. You can see that uh, there were activities in uh, different uh, cities like in Nice, uh, in Toulouse, in Lille, in Salzburg, uh, in Kurigem, Molenbeek and in some uh, Tunisian cities, Fax, Tunis and Gerba. And um, we won't go into detail with all the um, concrete um, examples, but you can go through it and some of them will be mentioned um, during our uh, presentation in the next uh, few minutes. Here you can see that we um, distinguish four uh, modules uh, in the framework of Citizens Agora or four goals. We can say there are um, four, four aims, four goals. And uh, the first one is uh, information and awareness raising because we believe that it is important that uh, the general public uh, is informed and aware of uh, different forms of radicalization, of the problem, of the topic uh, and so on. And uh, you can see the uh, symbols here um, for each of these uh, elements. Then the second one is dialogue and empowerment. Uh, it is clear that uh, in a citizen's agora, we want to bring people into dialogue. We want to empower them uh, to be um, uh, self-confident and competent for participation in uh, the public space. Then the third um, element or module is voice and participation. Um, uh, voice and participation means participa participation also in local decision making. Uh, so uh, you will see later that it is about youth councils, about the preparation for um, participating in local decision making. And the fourth one is networks and social capital, um, because it is of course important uh, to build networks to exchange with different uh, groups and players and to uh, strengthen social capital. So that's um, all from my side and I give now the word to my colleague uh, Heiko Berner. Thank you, Markus. I come to the first goal. This is called information and awareness raising. This goal aims to provide information about concerns in daily life, addressing a basic need that helps young people to participate in decision making processes. These processes may take place in questions of social participation, for example, in the neighborhood or at school or in po local political decisions. People suffering from a lack of information are unable to participate to the same extent as people who know their environment well. One of the core competences for education in democratic citizenship is the so-called cognitive competence. It concerns knowledge of the political system and on the rights that citizens have in their local or national contexts. In addition, knowledge of the social and cultural frameworks and of the environment is important for the ability to participate in public life and decisions. In many cases, a lack of information prevents people from participating in common activities or articulating opinions within these environments. In other cases, people avoid entering a new environment because the invisible thresholds are too high. Providing information, therefore, becomes a central strategy that helps people to participate in daily life and in local decision-making processes. Information here also becomes a measure for helping people to gain awareness of different forms of disadvantage or exclusion. The evaluations of Citizens Agora included two types of measures that intend to inform people and to raise awareness. One of them are information points, the other ones are bigger campaigns. 
Providing information may be fairly easy. Put a market stand at a local market and provide the information to everyone who passes by and is interested in your topic, and then get into conversation with him. That is exactly what the project for Information Laïcité Citoyenneté is doing in the district of Aouret in the French city Toulouse. It was implemented in the district market and is open every Friday from 8 a.m. to 12 o'clock. The reason for developing this specific intervention was the growing number of fundamentalist stands on the market in Fauret. The organizers are local clubs, which collaborate with local authority. The aim of the info point is to provide information about radicalization, but also about the democratic system. An information point may be a component of a bigger campaign. Usually, a smaller institution does not have the resources to realize such a campaign. So it is more often organized by local authorities or political establishments. In 2015, together with representatives of civil society, the Austrian city of Salzburg started a campaign against right-wing extremism called 88 gegen rechts, 88 against right-wing extremism. That year, there was a specific cause a large amount of right-wing graffiti had appeared in the city. Therefore, the local authority organized public events such as lectures, concerts, video presentations, flyers, posters all over Salzburg. In terms of info points or campaigns, there are some general characteristics that should be considered. The cooperation between professional experts that might be social or youth workers and experts in terms of radicalization processes and local politics or administrations is helpful. When organizing an info point, you should keep in mind the backing of the letter and financial support. In the case of a campaign, which channels should be used? Is it useful to address the audience on a local market or would it be more feasible to try to reach the addresses via social media platforms. Do the channel allow dialogue with the target audience or is it only a one-way communication? What are your objectives? The dissemination of a general attitude or is there a specific reason? Who is the target audience? The broader public or specific target groups? Depending on this, where should our activity take place? Who could get, get involved? Social work professionals or experts or peers or a mixed team? And finally, don't forget the evaluation and development of the activity. The second goal is dialogue and empowerment. The example have already shown that raising awareness may be easier in contexts where dialogue takes place. A campaign may have an impact on the addressees, but if a whole group discusses a topic, the effect may be much stronger. Thus, dialogue becomes a first step in processes of empowerment. Empowerment means fostering the skills and potential of individuals or groups that are vulnerable or socially disadvantaged in any way. Empowerment aims to achieve autonomy for those people who do not have the resources to participate equally in society. One crucial goal is the establishment of a higher degree of autonomy of these people. Empowerment measures can only succeed if relationship between social workers and young people and between young people themselves can develop and if professionals offer the, youth, the young people safe spaces where they can express their needs without fear of rejection. In this sense, dialogue is a first step towards or a condition, condition for empowerment. Dialogue is a measure that helps with the empowerment of young people if it is offered continuously over a prolonged period and in a way that tolerates conflict. Workshops are a fairly common measure to generate dialogue. There are multiple forms of workshops. Usually they follow a defined structure, they have a time plan, an agenda and a specific method or mix of methods, but open formats also exist. In Salzburg, a format called COMEX, Comedy and Extremism, was created in 2018. It intends to enable young people to gain awareness of extremism as well as stereotypes and prejudices. The method is an experiment. Humor and elements of comedy help the participants to start rethinking their routines and habits. The implementers created a workshop idea 
which includes several methods of entering into discussion. The discussions take place between participants and implementers, but also between the young people if they have different perspectives or opinions. Trouve ta place, or the um, Développement de l'esprit critique was a workshop project in Nice, which took place in 2017 and 18. Proof Tablas included a package of three workshops in which gender stereotypes and extremist propaganda were the issues. It was part of the concept of Proof Tablas that the experienced implementers aimed to respond directly to the needs of the participants, thus facilitating dialogue. In summary, the workshop is a useful format when it comes to raising awareness and stimulating dialogue, but for more personal re relationships, other concepts might work better. One of the social spaces most visited by young people is the virtual space. It seems a good idea to implement social outreach work in this space. There are various provisions that aim to make contact with young people via social media. One example is Les Promeneurs du Nez. Created in 2000 in Sweden, the concept was transferred to France in 2012 and now exists all over the country. Indeed, one method of youth outreach work is a presence in the virtual space. Although that does not mean traditional youth outreach work is obsolete. Youth outreach work is one of the most demanding measures in the field of early prevention. Usually, a social worker or a social educator is responsible for an area or a district in a city, but implementation also makes sense in rural areas. In Salzburg, a project called Streusalz, which means scattering salt, has been running since 2009. The idea is to provide a variety of different activities to teenagers in nine districts of Salzburg. One crucial element in youth out outreach work is connections over a prolonged period, which allow relationship work. Short-time working contracts are therefore damaging to this approach. Indeed, the working conditions in general should allow social workers to stay for a longer time. Supervision and enough stuff are important. Again, there are some general characteristics that should be considered. Which workshop method fits best our target audience and the topic? Do we want to enter into dialogue with a specific target group or do we intend to bring different individuals or group into contact and exchange with one another or both? Do the participants form a heterogeneous or a homogeneous group? Trust is crucial. You should aim to enter into trustful relationships. Do we spend a longer period with the target audience in order to form a more familiar relationship? Vocational contracts of the youth workers are crucial. Do they allow the development of relationships over, over a longer period, or does the project stop after a defined period? We have to care for the needs and opinions of our target audience. Try to find out whether they are aware of them. Are they able to articulate them? Safe spaces are a necessary tool when it comes to open exchange with our target audience. What kind of safety do they need? This might be a girls' room, a gym, or a youth center. Supporters of various institutions, such as teachers or school social workers, are valuable resources. Think about your own well-being. Supervision and team meetings are helpful. We now come to the third goal that uh, is going to be introduced by Marcus. Yes, uh, we come to the next uh, one that's uh, voice and participation and um, some general um, remarks uh, on what we mean by voice and participation. It is important to say that um, voice and participation mean that people affected by a political decision can also participate in that political decision. That's the general assumption. Uh, and uh, this requires, of course, the possibility of raising one's own voice, articulating one's own standpoint, feeding it into the political debate. And um, in today's representative democracies, uh, the opportunities for participation uh, are theoretically, of course, they should be equally distributed. But in reality, we see that uh, there are many discrepancies between 
uh, advantaged groups and disadvantaged groups. So, for example, people without citizenship and children or young people usually uh, have no right to vote. So they are excluded, excluded from one of the most important uh, political rights because they don't have a citizenship or because they uh, are not old enough. Uh, then there are also groups that are unwilling to or inhibited from participation as a result of socio-economic cleavages or disadvantages. And uh, cities and regions can uh, implement uh, certain measures to enable these people to have a voice in uh, the political decision-making process, even if they are not um, uh, do not have the citizenship of the country. Uh, and in recent years, we see that a large number of uh, democratic innovations have been developed uh, to this end. Uh, in this respect, voice and participation uh, also mean that the political stakeholders of a city or region incorporate the suggestions of the citizens into their political concepts, because otherwise this would only be a kind of alibi uh, participation. So political participation measures make sense if this participation leads to visible consequences and representatives should therefore commit themselves or in some way maybe even be obliged by certain agreements or uh, maybe even by laws to incorporate or implement or at least discuss the results of participatory um, activities. So we um, distinguished in our uh, project uh, two things. The one is the pre preparation or the preparing for voice and participation. And the second one is uh, uh, the analysis of specific participation. And uh, there we focused on youth councils. So um, I, I'm not going to tell you uh, a lot about the preparation for voice and participation because this is uh, something that um, our colleagues uh, from Max uh, and mainly Veronique de Lénaire um, uh, carried out in the project. Just a few words about it. Uh, the idea is that people who are not used to expressing themselves um, or talking about their concerns in, in the public, they must first be enabled to do so through various measures. They must be strengthened. Uh, they uh, must have some kind of training maybe um, in order to be prepared for participation in the public uh, debate. So everything that is understood by the term uh, democratic or inclusive citizenship education could be seen as a kind of preparation for later political participation. And that happens in schools, in open youth work and in other contexts. And as I uh, said, our colleagues from, uh, from Max, um, they carried out uh, digital storytelling in uh, the framework of the project and uh, you can uh, go into this um, via the link on the slide and of course you can uh, ask your questions if you if you are interested in in the details um, I am now focusing on youth councils they are uh, if you want a new participation format that makes it possible for young people to deal intensively with local issues to find constructive solutions and it is of course um, a, a sub form of citizens councils um, and a format of participatory uh, democracy so uh, participants usually are selected at random on the basis of the civil register or uh, they are invited to participate by uh, a letter from the mayor or in some examples they are um, asked to participate um, by a contact through social work. So the group then represents the council and works together to discuss solutions to local or regional problems. And in the last few years, we can see a variety uh, in terms of topics, in terms of procedures, the way these uh, councils are carried out and so on. So uh, there is a broad variety um, in these youth councils and we, in our project, uh, we um, compared um, two forms. Uh, the one uh, is, uh, is uh, carried out in Toulouse um, and the other one uh, in Salzburg. Um, and uh, although 
uh, the results from Salzburg stem from another, from an earlier project. We have now a quite a good um, possibility to compare the two concepts. And you can see on this slide that uh, there are some differences in the number of participants. So there were more in Toulouse than in Salzburg, uh, usually then uh, in terms of frequency, uh, in terms of recruitment uh, and so on. So you can, you can have a, a look at this slide in more detail on your own. I would like to summarize some aspects that come out of uh, these differences and our comparison. And that's what I summarized here in this, uh, um, on this slide, some general characteristics and questions you should take into account if you um, carry out the youth council. So a key challenge is of course to reach those uh, people who are less privileged in terms of education and income. So the preparation for articulation is important, as I said before, uh, things like digital storytelling and, and, and empowering uh, activities. Um, innovative tools are, are important to empower young people. Then uh, it is uh, a good idea to get in touch with schools, with social workers, with youth associations, with NGOs uh, and seek their support so um, that you have a better access to different groups of, of young people. Inform and encourage not only the young people, but also the parents, the teachers, the employers to allow and support participation. Because often uh, we, we, um, we saw that parents or teachers or others or employers can be an obstacle uh, for the young people to participate in that. Then um, to make it easier for an individual uh, young person to participate, uh, you could uh, offer a friendship ticket. That means that you, uh, that uh, the person that is selected can bring a friend, which gives the young people a feeling of safety because they come into a surrounding where they maybe uh, do not know others. And if they have a friend with them, then it's easier for them to participate. Then um, be very clear on the aims of the Youth Council. Where are the limits? So tell the people that it is uh, not binding. Um, think about the best time frame and frequency. You can see on this uh, other slide with the comparison between Salzburg and Toulouse that there are different ways to organize it. You can either organize punctual events um, for one and a half day like in Salzburg or you can organize a monthly, uh, monthly meetings over for example one and a half years like uh, in Toulouse. So both have advantages and disadvantages and for longer form it, it might be difficult to maintain the number of participants but on the other hand you have a group where uh, the work continues and is may maybe more sustainable. Then make travel and participation as easy as possible. Support those for whom participation is more difficult because for example they live far away or are otherwise restricted. And also um, it should be taken into account that certain days might not work for certain groups such as maybe religious holidays and they should therefore be avoided as council days. So in general guarantee a trusting um, atmosphere do not exclude unorthodox, critical or provocative suggestions and keep participants informed in the follow-up process. That's um, on voice and participation and I'll now, now give the word to Heiko again for the next uh, element, networks and social capital. Thank you, Markus. When presenting and discussing the different measures or examples of early prevention in the last three section, uh, one unifying element emerged. To a certain degree, most of the measures need networks in order to make an impact. Networking means collecting social capital. Social capital means relationships with other people or institutions that support our intentions. Two types can be distinguished. The first type refers to the sociologist Pierre Bourdieu. Here, social capital concerns the personal contacts of an individual family, the peer group, school friends, and so on. These contacts help the individual to find his or her way in daily life. They also help him or her to solve problems or to overcome obstacles. 
The Putnam type of social capital refers to institutions located within a community. These may be schools, churches, public administration, the youth center, or a sports or cultural club. Here, the assumption is that social cohesion depends on these institutions. The better the connections of the individuals to these institutions, the higher the degree of social co cohesion. Both types of social capital are important when it comes to early prevention, and most of the interventions use social capital as a means or as a goal. If we look at the different measures presented above, we see that some of them focus mainly on the second approach. An information point may bring individuals into contact with institutionalized provisions by advertising them. This is the case, for example, with the Point Information La ICT is situated which spreads information about citizen awareness and the electoral system. Yet, networking also takes place within the measure itself. Usually, different experts and representatives of local authorities work together when creating, planning and implementing the measures. Sometimes they are meeting each other for the first time and thus they expand their professional network. Other formats, such as workshops, also support communication and better understanding between young people. Here we have an example of the first type of accumulation of social capital. If young people know one another and stop excluding minorities, they can empower one another better. Solidarity then becomes a source of power, or in other words, social capital. Both workshops presented here, Comex and Trufta Plus, aim to achieve this effect. The more advanced measures, such as open youth work or youth councils, have an effect on both levels. They systematically contact heterogeneous individuals or groups of people, of young people, and they support exchange and social mixing. The methods they use are quite different though. Open youth work, for instance, uses sports or cultural activities as resources for relationship work and therefore works very patiently over a longer period. Youth councils focus on topics that concern shaping the living environments of the young people. The exchanges are on a more formal level and have the aim of expressing the perspectives of participants. Some general characteristics may be considered. The first question is, what kind of social capital plays an important role? Individual contacts and or contacts to or between institutions within a community? Is it a goal to strengthen the contacts and intermixing between heterogeneous groups of young people? Is it a goal to inform them about supporting institutions? And finally, do not forget about representatives of the target groups. They should also be involved in the planning processes of early prevention interventions. After these short descriptions of various examples and measures of early prevention and some general observations, we would like to come to our lessons learned. First, I'd like to share some thoughts about the topics trust, relationship work and safe spaces. Trust is an important factor for successful early prevention. Trust may be the result of shared personal habits or characteristics. If a workshop leader seems to perform in an authentic and credible way, and if he or she shows a certain understanding of life, his or her clients a kind of credit of trust to, uh, of his clients, a kind of credit trust may result. Yet that is not enough. If trust is an objective, then participants of the intervention should have the opportunity to participate in drafting the goals of the common activities. The participation is a crucial condition for trusting relationships. Not every form of intervention is capable of offering a higher degree of participation. For example, in many cases, the implementers of um, uh, the implementers of an information point will create the goals of their activity without entering into a, a dialogue with their target crew. 
This approach is possible, but it will, it will not foster closer trusting relationships with the target audience. A solution, if desired, could be to create the information stand together with young people who belong to the target group. The dialogue between the different implementers and participants in their different roles will benefit from such a method. In more complex settings, such as a youth outreach work, a method and a goal may be to form close relationships with the target audience. This approach is quite demanding because the social worker and the young people meet one another in different roles with different forms of power. Well, on the one hand, the social worker is a professional who usually has more knowledge, more um, experience and a higher degree of education that makes him or her superior to the young people in one sense. On the other hand, the young people have expertise in their living environments and in their community, and they do not need the street worker. That makes them independent of him or her. One possible way of forming relationships is to use the specific resources of a street worker and to support the young people when it comes to everyday problems that they cannot solve without support. This might include conflict in the neighborhood or planning and shaping their living environment. This way of forming relationships makes sense because such a basic support includes a relationship building effect. Advocacy is not only an ethical requirement, but also helpful in methodological sense. Safe spaces. One of the main findings of Citizens Agora is that safe spaces are crucial when it comes to the creation of spaces in which dialogue, discussions and even conflict may be realized. Trust and good relationships among participants are conditions for such safe spaces. Safe spaces are specific spaces where people meet, but the term also refers to a methodological approach that helps participants to articulate their needs and opinions without fear of rejection or exclusion. Heterogeneous groups may also get together, especially if they are accompanied by mediators who support the participants with forming connections and intermixing. Minorities that might need protection from exclusion are especially relevant in such intermixed groups. The moderator particularly has to take care of them. Then the safe space can become a place that tolerates conflict. As a result of feeling safe, young people may start to articulate their needs. The general finding is that before participants in early prevention measures start to express opinions, they ex express basic needs. They start by talking about problems in their everyday life or with family or even about taboos. Safe spaces and relationship work go hand in hand and both have to be understood as processes. A safe space is never accomplished in the sense that it lasts. The participants have to cultivate it just like their relationships. Care for the social workers is another crucial topic. This means they need the opportunity for continuous reflection of their work, ideally in the form of regular team supervisions and internal exchanges with colleagues. Three conclusions may be defined. Trust encourages young people to participate and to form connections with others. Safety before articulation. This means participation and the formation of connection with other young people are possible in safe spaces. Needs before opinions. This means before you start expressing an opinion, you start expressing your needs. You talk about everyday subjects, problems with parents or taboos. This is a condition for the expression of opinions and therefore for participation in public issues. Safety as a concept. The prevention of radicalization is very often a subject of security politics. We may talk about the securitization of this discussion. The objective of, of security politics is a society that is characterized by certainty and peace. But there is a price that has to be paid for this effect. If by security we mean defense against a potential danger from outside, this approach necessarily results in the formation of an inner group that has to be defended 
and an outer group, the potential threat. In the case of prevention of radicalization, this attitude seems to produce an undesired outcome. It provokes the exclusion of individuals or groups or imagined groups and reproduces social stigmas. There is therefore also a strong argument that not only are security politics an adequate approach for the prevention of radicalization processes, but also that measures to foster empowerment processes are appropriate or even more advantageous. The findings of Citizens Agora discussed here correspond to this approach. The German word Sicherheit can be translated into English in two ways, safety and security. Whilst security refers to the threats from outside, safety can be described as the interior moment of a system that functions well. Since political and religious radicalizations grow within societies, safety within a group may be a concept that more successfully results in social cohesion and thus in the prevention of radicalization. The findings of Citizens Agora evaluations supports these support these arguments. Young people in city districts are heterogeneous groups and more importantly, different majorities and minorities result from this heterogeneity. It is therefore necessary to protect minorities, otherwise they will not articulate their opinions or begin to exchange ideas with members of majorities. Protection does not mean protection from majorities but rather support to become a part of a common group. This relates to an inclusive approach. Safe spaces with mediators or tutors are important. Trust and relationship work is needed. It is obvious that long-term interventions can succeed better than workshops that are conducted only once. Affirmative action helps to create a safe space. Empowerment is a good measure to reach these goals. And finally, the goal of safety should not be certainty and peace, but rather conflict tolerance, openness and sincerity. We come to our second topic of our recommendations and of our conclusions. Markus is going to present it. Thank you, Heike. Now we are going to talk about the possibility of revolt in the setting and this might uh, frighten uh, some of you and you may wonder what has revolt to do with uh, citizens agoras. I'll try to, um, to explain uh, the idea behind that. So uh, the first thing that is very important is that uh, revolt is to be understood as non-violent resistance against oppression, authoritarianism and injustice. And we believe that this um, capacity to be able to say no to oppression, authoritarianism and injustice is very important for democratic citizenship. And uh, in order to be a Democrat, you need to be uh, able, but also you need to be allowed to revolt in this sense. So uh, it is nothing else than the idea that uh, people should uh, be able and allowed to criticize, to say no uh, to the ruling authorities and uh, without being sanctioned straight, straight away. And we believe that in, uh, in the local context, uh, also in the context of uh, citizens agoras and uh, spaces where you uh, organize debates and dialogue between people, um, such uh, such a kind of revolt needs to be uh, enabled. So we even would uh, say maybe um, in a certain way that might be provocative for you, but we would even say uh, encourage rebellious statements. So the, the first uh, reason for that is that man, many young people are not used to express uh, their opinions in, in a way that meets the standards of a democratic debate. Uh, and uh, they are in a rebellious age maybe and, and, and uh, so this should be taken into consideration and it should not uh, lead to the suppression of opinions. So um, of course young people um, in such, such a context 
might um, use uh, uh, provocative uh, statements in order to raise um, attention. And uh, we believe that this should not uh, be sanctions sanctioned too, uh, too easily, but it should be taken into, in, into account. And the second thing is that um, we believe that dialogue comes before results or dialogue is more, impo more important than results. That's not always easy to realize. Of course, I, uh, we understand that. But um, in addition to a certain tolerance for provocative or rebellious formulations, an interest in unorthodox and rebellious content is needed. So uh, these should not immediately be sifted out in favor of a compromise but uh, they should be taken up as original ideas maybe because very often uh, group processes have a tendency to compromise and to, um, to exclude uh, opinions uh, at, uh, at the edge of the spectrum. So if strongly divergent opinions and ideas make it impossible to reach a result, the process of discussion uh, takes precedence over the outcome. That would be uh, uh, our suggestion. Nevertheless, an attempt, of course, should be made to reach a compromise between the different points of view or between uh, different poles of, uh, of a topic within a given time frame, because you will al always only have a certain time frame and uh, you, you should be aware of, uh, of this um, difficult uh, yeah, um, dilemma maybe between um, rebellious um, opinions and the need to find a compromise. Uh, we summed it up in uh, on this slide. So revolt and democratic dialogue um, and democracy are inseparably linked. That's the, the theoretical assumption if you want. Only when you have the opportunity to say no to oppression, authoritarianism and injustice, can you experience uh, democracy? Young people in particular need such experiences of democracy in their development and they need it because very often in our daily lives it is not so easy to make democratic experience. If you think about the context of a school or a workplace or other contexts, then it is very often um, very hierarchical uh, structures uh, in place and uh, it won't be easy to make democratic experiences. So the revolt of young people, which can also be provocative and challenging in expression and content, should be answered constructively and should be should lead to a should lead to a dialogue. Differing opinions should not be sorted out immediately, but if possible, they should be discussed. I know that it is not always possible, but if it's possible, they should be discussed. So that leads to the uh, principle that dialogue is more important than a result or a final output. And if a final decision or output must be reached because of the uh, setting or the, uh, the goals or because of the expectations uh, from um, different groups, it should be the outcome of an open and inclusive debate. Everybody should be encouraged to express opposing arguments and unorthodox ideas or opinions. Then uh, we come to the um, to the last part of our presentation and uh, these are some um, some remarks and lessons about evaluation. First thing to say is that we really believe that evaluation is important. It should not uh, be just an obligation for the project um, uh, officer or whoever uh, the one who finances it or for the stakeholders, it should really be an equal part of the project because uh, it can uh, improve uh, the processes and uh, the outcomes of further uh, project of the future. So um, we believe that uh, it is important that an evaluation takes place and we believe that it uh, should be a dialogue between all persons involved and it should not be seen as a control instrument, um, but more as a contribution to the overall success of a project or of uh, an activity. And the methods depend on the concrete project, of course, and the activity or the goals. 
Uh, very often it is useful to have interviews with different groups, with organizers, with stakeholders, participants, with target groups, of course. And uh, you should observe in a systematic manner or collect data, either by surveys, by media reports, etc. So um, there are many ways to carry out uh, evaluations and uh, there are many sources. Uh, these sources can also be photographs, videos, diaries or other empirical material. Um, evaluation of measures against radicalization or for prevention of violent extremism um, are a specific challenge. Uh, and uh, with, we believe that it is important that the general political and social situation uh, or activity is uh, considered in such an evaluation. Participants of activities must be sure that they can speak openly and that their anonymity is respected. So they should have the feeling of a safe space as Heiko already described it before. And then uh, it is very important, especially in such a sensitive topic, that uh, the communication of results is very uh, careful. So uh, because um, if uh, political uh, stakeholders um, read or hear about uh, evaluation results in this uh, topic, they could use it or misuse it for their own purposes. So it is very important to communicate carefully. There are, of course, many other things to say about evaluations, um, but uh, we just want to mention some uh, aspects here that are related to the field of, um, of uh, uh, prevention of radicalization and extremism. So um, the, last, um, the last points are that the evaluation plan should be developed in the collaboration of academics and practitioners and partners involved. Um, an evaluation uh, will be much more respected if it was planned in a participatory way. Um, so that was very important also for us in the project to uh, involve the different players into the planning of the evaluation. Then in con it can consist of different parts, a conceptual evaluation, a process evaluation, and an evaluation of results, outputs, outcomes, impact and sustainability. A general description of the activities, of the aims and goals, time, frequency, budget, place and persons involved, uh, of course, should be part of the um, evaluation, but also the perceptions of principals, organizers, implementers, and of course, mainly the participants. And then a differentiated approach and qualitative research methods due to the sensitive nature of the topic are uh, important. And as I already mentioned, evaluation should be seen as an equal part and the involvement of experienced experts to carry out or support the evaluation should also be um, considered. Well, that's uh, all from our side for this um, short um, presentation of, of the um, very diverse results of our project and the work package on uh, Citizens Agora. We hope that it um, is helpful for you and um, that you uh, contact us if you have any further questions. And uh, so that's all from our side. We wish you the best in these difficult times and uh, hope uh, to collab collaborate with you maybe one day. Goodbye and all the best. Thank you. Goodbye. Hope you enjoyed the webinar and the presentation from the experts. Thank you for your questions. Please expect an answer next week on the dedicated page on the EFOS website. Last but not least, don't forget to register for the next activities of the final conference. Thank you for your attention. Have a nice day.